Welcome to part two of our Birds of the Sanctuary. We hope you enjoyed part one. We hope you enjoyed this part just as much. We'll be covering a few extra birds, uh, cockies for instance, and a variety of those, a common term, and um, magpies, uh, wonderful, wonderful stories on the magpies, a little mate, the blue wren, and a few other birds that I hope you'll really enjoy. And finally, at the end of this session, we're going to talk about the threats to these wonderful creatures of ours here in the sanctuary and what we can do about them. Swallows, up close, they're truly beautiful, as you just saw then, but further away, they're just nice. Very sweet little things. They, they're seasonal. I believe they fly down from the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, I find it very difficult to believe. I'm told it many times because of the, the distance and adverse winds. And uh, as we, you've got birds in, further around the bay that come from the Northern Hemisphere, and if the winds are against them, they just simply die on the way, falling into the water exhausted. But it's fun to walk along the seaweed with them around because when you walk along the seaweed along the beach, it upsets all the little insects that fly out. Look around, you often find a swallow moving along behind you, snapping them up, then doing a loop around you and coming back and coming down again. So they're a delight. And surprisingly, they've been hugely successful in the world and there are 83 species worldwide. Wattle birds are lovely here too. There's big little wattle birds and little wattle birds, and the males have bigger wattles. But uh, they, um, at the tea house, because they like a sweet tooth, they'll sneak in here. There's one on, on the chair. That one was so very bossy. If you didn't give her a sugar cube or hold sugar up to her, she would shout, shout and squawk and carry on. Everyone would be looking up and saying, you shouldn't have animals in here and all the rest of it. But the truth of it was, it's very hard to resist. Her name was Maddie. And what's surprising and really beautiful about her, she, when she was about four, and they didn't live much more, too much longer than that, she brought in her two young to show us, and actually brought them in and walked around under the table and said, look, if you touch these guys, Mike Letch and Ray Lewis, you've got every chance of getting a bit of sugar. There's Mike. Will's leading disabled diver, passionate and in love with Maddie. <laughs> So they're, they're the beautiful, but mostly and properly, they feed on Banksia sugar. There's Kim Wright, a local, very, very significant man in terms of uh, some areas of science. But everyone got joy out of it, including uh, disabled people coming down here, intellectually disabled, who get Maddie to go over and take some sugar from them, and they were truly moved. This section is just on a couple of different birds. That's uh, an oyster catcher. We have a family turn up each year, and there were two families, just one. There's a pair there, and they normally have up to three young, and uh, they're around for a couple of months, then they sort of disappear again. They're beautifully coloured and, and, uh, and quite gregarious birds, but a little shy. Uh, there's a mask lapwing, I think, that should be coming up. There he is. Normally you see those around football grounds. That's when I used to see them as a kid and people see them. But at this time of the year, the marsh lapwings will come down to the reef and, and be feeding. And then again, over December and earlier, you'll see them and they're gone during the winter. Lovely birds, beautiful. And it's a thrill when you know what you're looking at. Um, I think too, uh, we get uh, ducks, but mostly only um, uh, our uh, wood, local wood ducks. You're going to see a bit of a remarkable film here, a film you'll never see again in your life after this. That, that, it's after this. That's the, uh, the Cerberus down at um, Black Rock, and it's full of little pied cormorants. There's little pied cormorants and big pied cormorants, and there's little black cormorants and big black cormorants, called magnificent uh, cormorants or something, uh, a strange name like that. But there is something you'll never see again. This is six foot from the shore of our beach. They're young black cormorants. 
There's over a hundred, maybe even 150, all cruising past like that. You're here back onto our, uh, our reef system, where that sargassum, that weed you can see, is quite edible for a lot of creatures, including me and other humans who know about it. And they're all young ones, you see, they're all puffed up as an adult. Beautiful, aren't they? Drying their wings. Most days when you come down and they've been out fishing, you find them coming back in and drying their wings. Lovely birds. Pretty good natured. Some birds vary in nature, you know, you can get the odd cranky crow. But uh, that stream of young ones in the water is exceptionally rare, being in so close. We didn't tend to use word cockies with anything with a curved beak. They're all lovely, a lot of them are really smart. And uh, you've got to remember they're not only cockatoos, but they're corellas, there's uh, lorikeets, there's parrots, there's galahs, cockatoos, rosellas, and more. So we generally call them cockies. All these ones we're showing you here are common around Bayside, and we're very fortunate. There can be some problems though. Problems because they can talk, and as you know, people for many, many years have kept cockies and taught them to talk. And in some of the rougher suburbs in Sydney, which will remain m nameless, people have been keeping corellas for many years. And in due course they move on or get tired of the corella, and so they let them go. What people then began hearing in the western suburbs is that the ones who knew how to swear rather loudly joined flocks who were wild and taught them as well. And they can be heard very, very easily and very, very clearly flying around Sydney in large flocks using the F word. <laughs> and uh, took a long while for people to understand how they'd manage that. And here's a pair of pink and grey galahs digging their nest. Nice to see. They've got an easier problem with housing than we have. Cockies have been brilliantly aware of music as well, uh, and have been filmed bobbing their heads in tune with the movie and singing very nicely with it. And magpies can do that too, of course. And But cockies can anticipate the beat on some of the music and where it's expected to go. They can use a, a wide variety of body parts too to dance the music. They'll put their wings out on special bits of beat and stomp with their feet. They're lovely creatures and we're very, very happy that they're around the place with us. Now here again, you can see that our perception of even the humble magpies changed. They're very, very smart magpies. Now, the important thing is they can each, there's a young one, or a girl, that's a female, see a grey back? A male's black and white strong colours, a female's very grey even as she matures. All magpies can be recognised by their patterns on their wing. As he turned around, you might have noticed if you're looking, this pattern on his right wing is different to one on the left. So what we decide to do is, lined up those coins, the Queen's head, always take them from the right, always take your Maggie's picture from the right wing. That's the way to remember it. The magpies will know you. Uh, magpies are known not to attack people, even in the mating season when they get very stroppy, uh, who they know personally and uh, we've had them, uh, I've had them at my home when uh, my, someone was watching an Elvis Presley movie and he was singing, the magpie sang and bounced and carolled to every song and as soon as he stopped, the magpie stopped. So you can see the difference in the wing patterns on those two. A little bit of family familiarity but not a lot. So if you know, the, if you, know you want to know your magpie, um, then take that picture on the right. Now, just about magpies, a few little anecdotes. There's a magpie called Thatcher up at Lake Eildon, there's a guy with a big, big gold watch, and he didn't like birds much. So my mate, who's birdie lovey, talked him into feeding this local magpie who liked the guy. So the guy did that and then got enamoured with him. So the guy used to walk down through the deep grass down to Lake Eildon on his big property and come back again. And one day he came back, and Mag uh, Thatcher wasn't with him. She'd gone halfway, which left him a bit worried. And then he looked at his hand, and his golden watch was gone. He sat down on his back step, really, really upset. About 10 minutes later came Thatcher. In her mouth was a gold watch, was so heavy she couldn't fly. She was tugging along painfully, step by step, to bring it back to him. We have a magpie at the Melbourne Golf Club, and she's worked out that when people go out playing golf, they like to take a snack. 
when they come back they don't eat at all. So she waits till they go inside the club for beer and she hops up on their golf cup baggies, unzips them and sticks around and has a look. Anecdotal, and we don't know whether this is true or not, but I haven't got a Tasmanian to, to doubt it. Magpies don't swoop Tasmanians. They swoop the rest of us, but not Tasmanians. And people think the only reason they can find is, is that the crims in the early days came out in black and white criminal suits. And the crims had nothing in their lives, so feeding a magpie would have been wonderful for them, giving some sense of relief. So they think that the magpies down there have inherited that want to leave alone people in black and white suits and humans down there. It's nice, isn't it? Among other things, magpies have now been shown to be able to individually recognise up to 200 different human faces. And it's an interesting thing, I hope it's relevant to this talk, but um, it made no sense to me with the size of the brain of birds, what they can do. It doesn't make any sense. The brain's too small. Till it turns out, that the bird brain is effectively much, much larger than it seems because the synapses and the little neurons at the end of them are much smaller than ours. So they compress a vast amount more uh, mental capacity in a much smaller space. The wren, this beautiful little blue wren, has lots of names, superb fairy wren, superb blue wren, blue wren. That's a female, and oh, that's a male there, I'm sorry, and this is a female. Um, if they're a little brown, a little more speckly, they're probably the neuters, because the neuters um, actually evolve into males when the male dies, probably about at three or four. But they're exquisitely beautiful little things, always living on the edge, twitch, 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 and this one's sitting on salt bush. And uh, they're really interesting. The girls are pretty smart. They realise that because when they build their nest, it's very close to the ground, it could be got out by water rats and things like that. Many things can get at it. So they're promiscuous and some of them have up to three nests in different areas to make certain that their progeny carries forward, which I think is pretty lovely. The other thing they do too, which is really nice, and I'm not quite certain why, but the blue wrens, that's little Bluey, little Pete we call him, he was around for years, he got to know us, we got to know him. Um, but the, the wrens actually sing when the eggs are still in egg form so that the little eggs can start hearing that sound. When they start cracking open, they'll know it's their parents coming to feed them and not necessarily some sort of predator. When a, as I mentioned, when a male dies, a younger um, bird in that little nesting group would, will uh, kick their testosterone will kick in and change to a male. And uh, when they, the testosterone does kick in, it kicks in pretty savagely and they'll stand on a post and they'll actually bail you up in that first sort of two or three weeks, they're just full of it. It's interesting that 10 years or so you really saw blue wrens like little Pete, and great joy to us, but the locals got together and we planted 5,000 trees along the foreshore and kept people clear of the area and the net result was as all that foliage recovered to the natural state, that little Pete came back followed, I believe these days, by about 10 families of little blue wrens between the Yacht Club and the Life Saving Club. I think you'll agree that our local ocean and foreshore bird heritage is precious. Unfortunately, it's under increasing stress which may eventually drive many of our bird life elsewhere. The main threats are the daily incursions by dogs on the loose and intrusive insensitive people combined with an apparent lack of bylaw policing resources. We all love our children enjoying the birds, but they must learn too to stand back in a non-threatening distance. Free-running dogs are unlikely to be able to control their enthusiasm for the chase. Dogs can't be expected to ditch their natural instincts and not trace birds. Now simple signs like these are needed. They work well and even this young puppy can understand them. Came up, looked, ran off again. Our local signs are too demanding in content due to the complex rules for people to take much notice of them. Dogs are welcome, of course, and we all love them, but they're best kept as shown here on beaches without exposed reefs nearby. Here is an excellent example coming up of how to enjoy the birds in a non-threatening and careful engagement. This young lady spent half an hour out there without disturbing a single bird by moving with intelligence and not threatening them as she walked. And here's a keen photographer 
who has wandered up slowly and obliquely past the birds to get the best position for filming. And as you can see, the pelicans showed little interest. The birds get to know us because they are aware of those who are threatening them and those who are not. We hope you've enjoyed our two videos covering some of the socially interesting facts about our birds rather than technical. We wanted to tell you about what they eat and what they drink and what they do so that they become more real and tangible and valuable to you. We've covered an awful lot of birds as you know, wonderful birds, pelicans, splendid birds down here, rainbow lorikeets, our little mate, little Pete, that little blue wren, the first little wren to come back in this area 10 years ago, after a long time of them being away, and many other birds that have been an absolute joy for us to see. And we hope that uh, you will come down this way, have a look out on our reefs and in our foreshore areas, enjoy it as much as we do. And when you do, bring your binoculars, your cameras, and your kids. And I hope that you too will then love it so much that you'll be anxious to protect it as we are and take action along the lines that uh, we've suggested in the video. Thanks very much for watching. Ray Lewis, take 155. And we're dealing with awful people. <laughs> See if I can get that up a bit higher so I can just...